or oh, yes, recording, yes. Uh, good, good afternoon or good morning or good evening, wherever you are uh, here. Um, so I hope today that I can give you a little flavor of what we are working on uh, at Utrecht University. So me, Stefan Liepma and uh, Erik van Sebeer, who is also here in the meeting. Um, and we're, we're actually looking at everything that flows in the ocean. Um, so pathways of things that float in the ocean that can be nutrients or heat or salt. But of course, for this project, we're, we're looking at plastic and um, in particular plastic that arrives at the Galapagos Islands. Um, and we do this work together, uh, mainly in collaboration with the Galapagos Conservation Trust. So with Andy Donnelly, I think he's also here and with Jen Jones. Um, and they have way more knowledge on the Galapagos Islands themselves. Uh, and we know a lot about the ocean. So I think that's, uh, that's a good match. So our main goal, get my mouse working, um, is to uh, actually to get this running, sorry. There we go. Um, so our main goal is to uh, predict where and when plastic arrives at the shorelines of the Galapagos. And you can see that uh, here in the in the animation that that would be kind of the end goal. So, so that would tell us when should we go where um, to clean up most strategically. And we really want to predict. So that means that we need to connect our sources um, from, for example, from the mainland or from fisheries uh, to the sinks, so the shorelines of the Galapagos and looking at the pathways through the ocean. But also an important point is uh, that we wanna uh, make it as strategic as possible, these cleanup efforts. So that means that, that we're not only interested in which locations receive most plastic from, from uh, remote sources, but also want to optimize for example, for how accessible a specific location is or what the impact is on the local wildlife or maybe tourism. Um, and also the connection of a specific location to other islands because the plastic does not always remain on shore but it can also go back into the ocean. And by going back, it might impact other islands. Um, and that's, that might also be locations that you want to prioritize for your cleanup. So we are not working on this alone. So in the in the bottom, you can see me and Eric, um, but uh, there are also uh, quite a lot of master students that are joining our project and they, they all have their little sub project and they work together uh, towards this main goal. And during this presentation, I'll show a few of their work as well. So to get everyone on the same page a little bit uh, of like we've been talking about simulations and pathways in the ocean. So what do we really do? Um, and it has everything to do with this, this tool. So it's called Ocean Parcels. And with this tool, we can, we can see how plastic moves through the ocean. Uh, but it needs, needs a few ingredients. Um, and with all these ingredients, there are also some assumptions maybe or limitations um, that maybe we can discuss at the end as well. Um, so the first ingredient that it needs, it needs something uh, on the ocean itself. So velocities, um, so it can, can see what the, what the state of the ocean is. So that can be ocean currents um, or waves. They also contribute through Stokes Drift to the transport of plastic uh, tidal velocities. But of, of course, also, for example, wind, if you have a big chunk of plastic floating at the ocean surface, uh, wind also has an impact on the movement of, of that piece of plastic. So that's the first set. Um, that goes in. And the second ingredient is more related to how plastic behaves uh, itself. Of course, we know that some plastic floats, but not all plastic floats. Um, so some is deeper in the water column and there are all kinds of processes related to that. Um, and when it reaches the shorelines, it can of course move from the ocean onto land, which is not uh, included in the velocity of course of the ocean models. Um, and it can, as I just said before, it can also return to the ocean. Uh, so that's what we call beaching and, and resuspension. And a last part that we also are very familiar with uh, is that it can fall apart. So it can, can fragment and it can, from one piece of plastic, you can create millions uh, that all, again, behave differently. Um, so that's also something that we have to tell uh, the model how to, how to deal with that. Um, and lastly, of course, we need to know where the plastic starts. So our sources, um, so we can track it accordingly. And with all these three main ingredients, there are, as I said, limitations. So, so I'll touch on that a little bit during the presentation. Um, and also maybe good to point here that in our study, we're really focusing on macroplastic. So the bigger pieces, 
um, and really focusing on, on cleaning those. So we prevent the formation of microplastic. Um, and that helps us in a way uh, that we can really focus on the surface of the ocean because most microplastic is floating. Um, and that we're also not looking at uh, fragmentation processes because we hope that we can remove the plastic before it can actually fragment. So by putting all this into our uh, tool, we can get out these pathways that represent how plastic is moving around. Uh, and then we can do some analysis, right? So, um, and it's all really uh, statistical analysis because looking at one pathway doesn't really tell you a lot. Um, uh, there's, there's a really small probability that the piece of plastic will precisely follow that path. But if you have 1 million pathways of, of particles that all do similar things, then it suddenly is a lot more reliable. So um, that's where a lot of statistics come in and also a lot of the more maybe computational uh, analysis uh, like network theory or machine learning uh, to really get this prediction going. Um, and the last point that's maybe also relevant for a lot of people here uh, is of course validation, because how do we know whether our model is doing a good job, right? So we need something to compare it with. Um, and the good thing of that is that it can also feed back uh, into our model and then improve it further. So this is kind of the framework that we're working with. And in all these different aspects, there are people uh, working very hard, also not just within our group, but also uh, uh, a lot of other people are trying to improve this day by day um, to get it more realistic. So to directly dive into the main challenge that we have, um, as I mentioned, the first ingredients were these velocities that we use to, to track plastic through the ocean. Um, but these all come from rather large scale ocean models. Um, so you can think uh, in this picture, we have a map um, a bit zoomed in on the Galapagos and you can send, see the island Santa Cruz there. Um, and this is a relatively high resolution shoreline. Uh, but if you then add our model resolution, so these are the, the coastal, coastal grids of our model with the highest resolution that we can actually use, which is approximately four kilometers, you can see it's rather a rough uh, representation of, of the coastline. And then a lot of the processes that, that, um, that cause any piece of plastic to end up on the beach, they're all small scale coastal processes that, that that we don't have in, in our large scale ocean model. And you can see that a bit better here. So, so the red dot is an example piece of plastic and then with a fancy PowerPoint uh, uh, gadget, you can make it move. Um, and then it ends up in this, in this ocean cell next to land. And then the question is, how do we determine whether that one will move onto land or whether it will stay in the ocean? And at the moment, all of that is done with parameterizations. So we, we add, in this case, we add a probability or a likelihood that it will beach yes or no with a specific time scale. And unfortunately, because we don't have that many measurements of, of anything from labs or from real world simulations, we, we for these time scales, we either take days or we take like months or years, um, and we don't know which number is, is the correct one to use. Uh, so you can see there's still quite a lot of uncertainty here. Um, and that's also the reason why we um, not only do modeling, but also try to get a bit more observations. And that's where we had this uh, drifter field campaign uh, organized. So you can see one of those drifters here in the bottom uh, photo, someone is holding it. Uh, they're quite small um, and they have a GPS and they float. So they kind of behave like uh, bigger pieces of plastic. And when you pull out this tab, I think she's doing that here in the photo, uh, the batteries turn on and you can just chuck them in the ocean um, and they will follow the ocean surface flow. Uh, you can also see that in this movie where one of them is deployed. Um, and it was great. Uh, unfortunately, of course, we could not go there ourselves uh, because of the past two years, well, pandemic things. Um, but we, we are very happy that we could collaborate with the Charles Darwin Foundation uh, and mainly with Inti Keith. She has helped us a lot to uh, organize and to uh, help to get the drifter ship to the Galapagos and also to deploy them uh, during their field work. Um, and then even at the locations that I specified, which were quite specific, but she managed to go to all of these. Um, so these are the triangles uh, here, the black triangles is where they were deployed. Um, and you can see the pathways that they took uh, in the past, last couple of months. Um, so this, this field work is kind of wrapped up now and we're analyzing all the data and 
in particular, we're analyzing, um, or we're at the moment really focusing on the drift that go close to shore. So this is one example here where you can see um, uh, a lot of jitter, more or less. So that means because the GPS has a specific error, it never is exactly on the same location. But this is really an indication that this drifter has beached. Um, and we can extract a lot of information from this. Um, for example, we, we of course want to look at this likelihood, see what that number is in the Galapagos and see whether that corresponds to our models. Um, and also see what local, local environmental parameters, how that adds up to how the drifter is behaving. So there's, there's a lot of things to do here. And we have a master student currently uh, taking the first steps and, and uh, trying to analyze all the data that we gain from this. So we're very excited to see, uh, see how, how far we can, can go with this. Um, and then moving on a little bit to the sources. So of course, there's also a lot of uncertainty in where the plastic is coming from. Um, we have one student who's specifically looking at the fishing industry uh, near the Galapagos. We all know that that's quite intense due to, uh, well, it's a very uh, beneficial location, I guess, to fish. Um, and she has looked at the past 10 years, uh, at least from data that is known from where fishing activity was taking place. Um, she has used the, the, the tool to, to simulate these pathways that specifically start at a location where, where fishing is taking place. Um, so you can see that in the map, so that the white little circles are locations of fishing uh, effort and the pathways is kind of a little spaghetti diagram, but these are all uh, uh, particles that, that end up on the Galapagos. So you can see uh, that, that actually most of them are still coming from, from where the Humboldt current is also going. Uh, so from, from, from east to west uh, towards like along Peru and then towards the Galapagos. Um, and the nice thing that you can do if you have this is that you can also play a little blame game, like we always call it. Um, so we can have a look at, at uh, for example, where, where it's coming from. So it's mainly from international waters. Um, as you may have guessed, and you might also know what the next question is uh, that we can answer with this, of course, is from who is it uh, or which flag are they uh, sailing under? Of course, it's debatable which country that is, uh, but we know most of that is coming from China. Um, and we can even take it one step further where there's a big uh, approximation there. Uh, of course, we have to estimate how much would they lose on a daily basis uh, to really make it quantitative. And of course, there's a lot, like a really large uncertainty there. Um, but at the moment, we estimate it to be in the order of several tons per year arriving at the Galapagos from the fishing industry. Um, so because there's just such an intense uh, uh, fishing effort going on, it adds up. I mean, if you would go fishing and you lose a piece of plastic, the chance is really, really small, small that it arrives on the Galapagos. So you have to keep that in mind. It's just because there are so many uh, that it adds up. Um, so then we move on to... Uh, uh, once we have all these pathways, we can do some analysis. Um, so, so this is where I'm mainly, I'm, I'm mainly on that side. So doing the analysis side. Um, and here you can see example, for example, if we know that, that there is a remote source of plastic coming near the Galapagos, which is here the red line, um, what will then happen to it once it arrives? Um, and I, I've added, this is kind of a sketch. So you see here all these gray lines. Those are potential pathways that the plastic can take. Um, so you can analyze this for any location along the Galapagos, and uh, then you can get this nice schematic. Uh, it might be a bit complex in the beginning to understand what's going on, uh, but basically on the x-axis you have all the islands, and then per island we look at what is the fate of the plastic that arrives there. So will it stay on the same location, will it stay on the same island, will it move to another island, or will it, will it maybe most likely go back into the ocean and leave uh, the Galapagos Marine Reserve. Um, so that's, that's what's shown here by the different colors. And then we can already see a few things from this, for example, that the really small islands are most likely to lose their plastic to the ocean and, and are not necessarily connected to other, other islands uh, in the Galapagos Marine Reserve. Um, something else that you can see is Isabella, that's the biggest island. And there's actually a really large part of Isabella that's not connected to any of the other islands, um, but also not that strongly connected to the ocean. So it mostly travels along those coastlines and will beach again and resuspend and then travel a little bit further, but it will stay in that region. And that's, that's interesting information to know if you think from a conserv 
conservation point of perspective. Um, and there are a few other things. So then if you look at Santiago or Santa Cruz, it's kind of the other way around. So they are more connected to other islands. Um, so, so they might be interesting to, to find these hotspots that, that are most useful to clean up, um, which is actually good news because it's also closer to civilization in a way. <laughs> um, I know it's, it's, there are not many people living there, but at least in Santa Cruz it's a bit more. Um, and, and you can go even a bit further uh, looking at whether there are some trends for all the islands uh, on whether it stays on the same island, so that's more on the eastern and western side of islands, or whether it um, is connected to other islands or to the ocean, which is mainly on the southern parts, at least for San Cruz de Bal and Santa Cruz, it doesn't add up for all the islands. Um, and we're working on making this, like turning this into a nice map, so it's more easily interpretable um, what the main flow patterns are. Um, then we can take it even one step further. I still have time, right? Yeah, so uh, now, now we're getting into the network theory. So I'm getting really excited as you can notice. Um, <laughs> so we can, for all these locations, we can we can have a look at how what their connection is um, uh, and how strong that connection is. And if you do that, so this is a transition matrix and you can translate that into this graph. Um, so basically every, every arrow tells you whether a piece of plastic will move from A to B or whether it will move from B to A. Um, and using this, you can apply network theory. And, and that's, you have different versions or different centralities as we call them. They all do something different or calculate something different. But our main goal here is to pinpoint whether a location is important for cleanup, yes or no. Uh, so for example, this is called highest in degree centrality, which means that a lot of plastic is coming towards you. So it's kind of like an accumulation point. So it could be maybe of interest to look at those. Um, another centrality, the other direction, um, is the highest between us centrality. That's kind of different between us, which indicates that uh, if you compare it with train stations, that you have a train station where all the trains have to pass through. Um, so those might also be good locations to clean up because a lot of plastic will pass by. Um, so we looked at different centralities, so you can ignore the theoretical background, but maybe focus on this plot because that might explain a bit better why, why it's interesting to do this. Um, basically, if you look here on the x-axis, it tells you how much should you clean of your coastline to get a specific reduction in pollution. Um, and you can see if you do that strategically, that you don't have to, so for example, if you would only clean up 10% of your coastline, you can already reduce 50% or something or even more of the pollution. Um, and then this is based on a very, uh, uh, um, I would say that this is very theoretical approach because we have a homogeneous, we assume here that the plastic is, is spread homogeneously, which is of course not the case. So if you also know where the plastic arrives, you can very effectively reduce your pollution very quickly with limited resources. I think that's, that's my main point I want to get across. Um, and of course we can also look then at which, which locations are those, uh, but this is still a work in progress. So don't, don't take this locations with a grain of salt, but as soon as we have a more, a better map, we will definitely share it with you. Um, so that's mainly what I wanted to share about the work we're doing. Um, I have one more slide on, on what I think is so valuable of, of this collaboration that we have going on here, um, in particular in relation to, to the modeling. And I know we also have a meeting planned, so maybe I can also repeat that there. Um, but uh, I think one point that's, that's important to note is that's really challenging to compare model results to observations. Um, often we either get a number of items found on the beach or, or, or the weight um, that's found on the beach, but it's very difficult to compare that to number of particles of an ocean model, where also there are so many estimates and assumptions that we make along the way uh, that a one-to-one -one comparison of those numbers is really difficult. But of course there are different ways to, to do that. Um, and another thing that's, that's difficult is that Yes, the resolution of our ocean models might be not super high, but also the temporal and spatial resolution of observations is often a bit too low to really make statistical uh, meaningful comparisons. Um, but that's also why we're so excited that now there is this synthesis going on to, to uh, get all the observations that have been done in the Southeast Pacific together. Um, and I think just a few 
well, remarks from our, our point of perspective is that especially uh, observations at remote locations are super useful because then we know that all of plastic is coming from the ocean. Um, um, so that's, that makes it easier for comparison. Um, and very important that, that clean beaches are also uh, nice observations uh, point for us, because then we can see if our model is doing a good, good job, yes or no, in those regions. Um, and lastly, um, as I said, this we kind of have this black box very close to the coastlines. So we use all these parameterizations to figure out what's going on in that box. Um, and one of the things that, that's also very helpful to have is to have a higher resolution of, of coastal features. So for example, whether we're, there are mangroves or whether there's a rocky shore or a sandy beach, uh, all those things really help with better tuning our, our parameters and to improve this beaching and resuspension process. So that's basically where I wanted to end. Uh, we always end kind of with this slide because we want to emphasize that whatever we're doing now specifically for the Galapagos, uh, we really hope to extend that to, to uh, any place on earth, uh, so globally, um, to hopefully tackle uh, this plastic pollution problem. So thanks a lot, and you can have a look at our website or, or Twitter um, uh, and see a lot of the nice animations that our group are doing. So, thank you. <laughs>